Mexico signs check to pay for Trump's border wall. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, you heard me correctly. Mexico has just signed a blank check, if you will, to pay for President Trump's big, beautiful border wall, whether they like to admit it or not. In a masterful move, President Trump sold the deal to the Mexican government as the United States-Mexico Trade Agreement. According to this report, the end result is the same. $25 billion is only a fraction of what is about to flood northward across the border because of the destruction of NAFTA. And yes, Bill Clinton was responsible for NAFTA. They might as well start loading pallets of pesos for shipment. President Trump never thought for a split second that the Mexican government would actually make a single lump sum payment explicitly for the wall. So according to this report, as he put it, Mexico will never cut a check to the U.S. Treasury, but President Donald Trump is zeroing in on the plan so that the president can argue America's southern neighbor will indeed fund the border wall. He didn't even have to tax remittances or threaten a VAT tax to do it. The powerful plan has bore fruit this week once again. President Trump did what his predecessors called impossible, and he made it look easy because he bluntly told everyone involved exactly what he was going to do, and then he did it. U.S. workers, car makers, manufacturers, and especially American taxpayers will benefit, according to Wayne Allen Root, who reported from the town hall meeting. According to Root, President Trump did it. He won. We all won. He guarantees the trade deal just signed will save us tens of billions perhaps hundreds of billions of dollars over the next decade. Even constructing the Cadillac model of the wall would come under $25 billion, a drop in the bucket compared to what is in store for U.S. industries. Once again, Trump accomplished what establishment politicians of both parties said could never be done. He has long blamed the 24-year-old NAFTA trade pact for disseminating the U.S. manufacturing industry and the loss of thousands of factory jobs. Stock in the Kansas City Southern Railroad jumped to a three-and-a-half-year high on news of the deal's acceptance. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, you will not hear that in the mainstream media. They upgraded the railroad operator because this week's trade deal with Mexico removed a wall of worry by removing a major hurdle According to KSU's investors, market analysis Jason Seidel of Cohen and Company, who advised the company gets nearly half of its revenue from Mexico, and steel is about to make a comeback because of the deal as well. S&P Global Platts announced this week that Nucor is ramping up to build a new galvanizing plant in central Mexico as part of the 50-50 joint venture with Japan's JFE. The company's CEO, John Ferrolia, agrees with the Trump administration that NAFTA needed to be updated, especially rules of origin stipulations in the current agreement. In Salt Lake City, Utah, Derek Miller is the president and CEO of the Salt Lake Chamber of Commerce. He is convinced the deal will bring predictability and stability to local manufacturers. A quote from Derek Miller, exports from Utah to Mexico have grown by over 300% in the last 10 years. A trade agreement with Mexico outlines the rules of the game so Utah companies can get in the game and win. He also hopes that Canada will take a hint and strike a similar bargain. Utah does even more business with Canada than they do with Mexico. Even left-leaning liberals have something to be happy about. The new pact includes several labor rules meant to benefit workers on both sides of the border. This report notes that American auto companies that assemble their cars in Mexico would also need to use more U.S.-made car parts to avoid tariffs, which would help U.S. manufactured workers. Another thing the deal calls for is increased wages for Mexican workers. About 40% of those cars would need to be made by workers earning at least $16 an hour, which they point out is three times more than Mexico's minimum wage. A notice of the finalized agreement will be sent to Congress on Friday. President Trump obviously is practically glowing about this. 
I like to call this deal the United States-Mexico Trade Agreement. I think it's an elegant name. Again, ladies and gentlemen, you won't hear this in the mainstream media. President Trump has also called on Canada a smaller segment compared with Mexico, who is referred to as a very large trading partner. According to updates in this report, Canada is a dominant exporter of crude oil to the United States. Well, that was then. It seems that since we have been stockpiling oil for 40 years, we might not be needing that Canadian crude oil much longer. The U.S. now has refining ability that we haven't had for decades, and we can actually start burning some domestic dead dinosaurs, if you will, until the oil market loosens up again. Under this Mexico agreement, 75% of cars will be required to be made with Northern American parts and 70% of the steel, aluminum, and glass used to make a vehicle must also originate in North America. For all intensive purposes, when Mexico caved into President Trump's demands for a level playing field, they might as well have directly signed a check to the president right then and there. When he was elected, I said I would call balls and strikes. When he did something that was good for workers, we'd support him. When he did something that was bad for workers, we would oppose him. Uh, unfortunately, to date, the things that he's done to hurt workers out pace what he's done to help workers. And with those comments, the head of the country's largest federation of labor unions ignited a feud with the president on Labor Day of all days. AFL-CIO Rich, President Richard Trumpka taking the White House to task this weekend on a host of issues from wages to NAFTA and President Trump not letting it slide, tweeting earlier today that Trumpka, quote, represented his union poorly on television this weekend. Some of the things he said were so against the working men and women of our country and the success of the U.S. itself that it is easy to see why unions are doing so poorly. A dem, he wrote, exclamation point. My next guest has a lot to say about this. He took his fight for labor rights all the way to the Supreme Court this year, winning government workers the right to choose if they want to pay union dues. It's up to the worker to decide what they want for themselves, not some other larger entity. Mark Janis is a former state worker in Illinois, now a senior fellow at the Liberty Justice Center. Mark, thanks for being here tonight. Good to have you joining us on this Labor Day. Um, talk to me a little bit about your reaction to what Richard Trumka said and how the president responded. Well, I think what we're, what we're really looking at is that worker rights are paramount, which is why I brought this case. And the fact that we're seeing at Liberty Justice a number of uh, people that are contacting us because they want to opt out. And, and we're talking government sector only here. We're not talking about private, you know, such as carpenters and the like. Um, and if the unions were doing such a great job and the unions were representing their people the way they should be and listening to the people, then probably my case would never have come uh, to the, the historical end that it did. And I probably would have never have filed it. But because they didn't, you know, we now have this, this situation that we're under today. Yeah. Uh, you know, in terms of re what, what bothered you was to have union leadership like Richard Trumka professing to sort of have a political viewpoint that represents all workers, correct? And, and you believe that, that that's, that's wrong and not worth paying dues into. Well, I, I think workers have the right to choose their own path, and I think the workers have the right to choose their own opinions. And to have somebody, you know, like Mr. Trumpka, you know, purport to say that he speaks for all workers, I think is, is, is erroneous. Uh, because not all workers, and myself included, believe that the leadership of these unions speak for everybody. You know, we are independent individual people. And to say that everybody within a union agrees and uh, with what the leadership says, I think is just wrong. What about the, what the president said about the decline of, of unions and the decline of membership uh, that has been overseen by Trumpka and a few others? Is that true, do you think? Well, I think what we're seeing is we're seeing individuals that are choosing to make their own decisions again. And, you know, look, our, our case that we put together was not, you know, to, to union bash, and it was not to try to put unions under and make them disappear. 
our case was about worker freedom and the right to choose. And if the unions are doing such a great job in representing their individuals that are members, then why do we have all these people contact, contacting Liberty Justice uh, wanting to opt out on, on the government side? Uh, that, that, I think, speaks volumes right there.